like to thank all of you for coming out tonight to, to uh, hear this talk. Um, I, uh, I first heard about this idea that maybe, maybe uh, Christianity is not at war with science or hasn't always been at war with science just a few years ago and was fascinated by it and uh, uh, have been exploring it ever since. I think uh, if you're like me, you grew up with the notion that there's this tension and conflict between religion and science. Um, maybe you saw the movie Inherit the Wind or something like that. And yet you've just grown up with this idea. Um, but the fact is, the relationship between science and uh, Christianity uh, was uh, much different for many years, and uh, in fact, um, there are people who say, uh, without Christianity, there wouldn't even be modern science as we know it. Uh, maybe that's an extreme statement, but I'll go through this and, and I'll let you uh, make judgments like that for yourselves. So here's a summary of the talk, and I'm sorry, I'm sure those of you in the back seat can't read these words, but just, just to encapsulate the talk, here it is. Modern science arose in Europe from a confluence of three major cultural streams, Greek philosophy, Roman law, and Judeo-Christian theology. Greek philosophy, with Aristotle and Euclid, for example, provided an emphasis on reason and also causality, cause and effect. Things happen because of causes. Roman law uh, gave us the concept of something called persona ficta, a fictive legal personality which uh, paved the way for self-governing legal entities including universities. Universities are very crucial in this story. And then finally, Christian theology and church policy provided a number of important ideas uh, such as that God is a trustworthy creator of a lawful cosmos, uh, reason is a valid tool for knowing God, empiricism, the idea of actually reading the book of nature, quote-unquote, that the universe is a book just as scripture is a book. And we can read it and learn about God. Uh, Christianity provided literacy in many regions. Uh, many people groups only uh, gained literacy when they gained Christianity at the same time. Uh, the church and state are separate entities. This hasn't always been true, but it's certainly an important idea that you render to Caesar what is Caesar, you render to God's what is God's, and those are separate entities, and one can protect against the other. So, Europe has been politically fragmented for hundreds, if not thousands of years, and yet religion and culture, religion could provide a kind of cultural unity that tied all of Europe together with a common language, in fact, Latin, even though there was all this political fragmentation going on. The church itself was a patron and founder of universities, and the church itself could be regarded as an example of a universitas, a fictive legal personality. And I'll point out why that's important in the rise of modern science. Okay, so we have to talk about what is science. We're going to talk about uh, the foundations of modern science. Of course, there are two meanings for the word science. One is it, it means an activity by which we obtain knowledge about the structure and behavior of the natural world and we, uh, through observation and experiment. And we express that knowledge in terms of laws, theories, and models. But, of, of course, science also means the body of knowledge that is produced by that activity. When can we call an activity science? That can be a little hard to say. It's kind of like art. What is art? How do, how do you answer the question, what is art? It's, it's difficult in many cases. Um, you know, all cultures make art, and all cultures try to observe and make sense of the universe, and all cultures use technology. That is, they develop tools, useful artifacts that they can use to manipulate the world. Around them. But technology is not the same thing as science, by any means. Um, but when I talk about modern science, or when historians talk about modern science, they mean empirical mathematical science. And that is an unusual, an unusual and recent human activity, and not many cultures 
No cultures except one developed empirical mathematical science. Uh, other cultures may have if they were given enough time, but as it turns out, only one culture did, which I'll tell you about. In empirical mathematical science, the idea is that experiments are crucial. You must observe the universe. You can't just sit in isolation and think about the universe and hope to know how it works. You have to go out and look at it. And then the results and ideas obtained thereby have to be expressed mathematically. So modern science is not the same thing as alchemy, astrology, sky watching, or nature classification. Uh, it has this empirical mathematical aspect. Now most historians say that modern science began with the scientific revolution. The scientific revolution occurred in Europe during the 16th and 17th centuries. Uh, it was the empirical mathematics, it was the introduction of empirical mathematical science. In the empirical, the experimental uh, focus, emphasis of, of this science uh, can be uh, found in Francis Bacon's philosophy, for example, uh, uh, where he outlines an inductive approach to nature. You, you make generalizations about nature based on individual observations. Um, the scientific method centers on experimental research, including artificial experiments. In other words, not just passively observing nature, but going out and doing something out of the ordinary, an experiment, to see what happens. And it's mathematical. Here's a quote from Galileo. He says, philosophy, by which he means physics, philosophy is written in this grand book, by which he means the universe, which, is, which stands continually open to our gaze. It is written in the language of mathematics, without which it is humanly impossible to understand a word of it. So this, this was the new attitude that, that uh, arose during the 16th and 17th centuries. Uh, you also started to see the institutionalization of scientific investigation. The first scientific society, the Royal Society of England, was founded in 1660. So, so that's what modern science is. It's this emphasis on uh, um, mathematics and experiments. There are other attributes of modern science. Uh, you know, prior to the scientific re revolution, it wasn't really appreciated that new knowledge was even possible. It was sort of assumed that the ancients knew everything and that culture had, the world had just decayed ever since the, the grand old days of the ancients. So the idea that we can discover things that Aristotle didn't even know about was, was a revolutionary idea. Um, but of course it was triggered by such things as the discovery of the New World in 1492. Uh, the Protestant Reformation in 1517 introduced a new Christianity. It was new. Um, Copernicus's book, De, Re De Revolutionibus, um, was a new theory about the solar system, the idea that the sun is at the center. Tycho's Nova, Tycho's new star in 1572, was a new star in the heavens. That should not happen, according to Aristotle, and yet there it was. Uh, the Galilean moons, Galileo, discovered new objects orbiting Jupiter. So all this new stuff started to happen uh, around the 1500s, 1600s. Uh, there were new tools, telescopes, microscopes, the barometer. There were new words to express uh, what was going on. I mean, the word discovery is, is kind of a new word. Uh, the word hypothesis, the word fact, these entered the English language uh, during the scientific revolution. Um, and there was this sense, there was this <coughs> pervasive sense that this all mattered hugely importantly. Uh, it, it's a kind of a, a sense of urgency and seriousness that characterizes the scientific revolution. That... Uh, uh, was not found in other cultures when they did technology. Uh, so, modern science then uh, ushered in, or I mean, the scientific revolution ushered in modern science. But, now, having gotten that out of the way, now you know what modern science is, where, 
where did the scientific revolution come from? Um, I, I sometimes think it would be funny to have a Monty Python skit where a bunch of primitive superstitious peasants in Europe are sitting around in 1400 and one of them says, you know, we ought to start doing science. You know, let's get rid of this superstition and become rational. As if it happened overnight. But it didn't. And so that would be a funny sketch. I'd like, I'd like to see that done. But the scientific revolution didn't just dawn one day out of nothing. The foundations for the scientific revolution had been laid over hundreds and hundreds of years prior to the 16th century. And that's what I want to tell you about and point out the role that Christianity played in all this. So, so let's look for the roots of the scientific revolution. But let's cast our net very widely. There's no reason at, at the beginning to confine ourselves just to Europe, for example. So uh, let's, look, let's look in three places just to pick uh, three good examples. We'll look at the Islamic world, we'll look at China, and we'll, then we'll look at Europe. So, uh, and let's start at, at a, I picked this interesting date of 700 AD or 700 CE, as historians would say, CE meaning the common era. What's the pink? Um, and, and I picked this date because, um, well, it's a pretty long time ago. And uh, actually, well, maybe you'll see as, as, as I go through this. Uh, why, it's, uh, why it's a good date. So here's a map of the empires, the nations of the earth, in, of most of the earth. I, you don't see the New World on here. But much of the earth in the year 700. And we'll look at two empires that were especially significant. Tang Dynasty China and the Islamic Caliphate that had spread over uh, North Africa and, and the Middle East. And actually that's one reason that 700... CE is important because uh, or it is a good date because those empires were big at that point. Uh, so that's where they are. Uh, so let's start with the Islamic world. By the year 750, the Islamic empire had spread across several continents and had spread very rapidly uh, since uh, uh, Muhammad um, died in 632. So within about 100 years, you know, the caliphates had spread over North Africa, Middle East, on up into Europe. Here's Spain. Here's Muslim Spain. It was Muslim by this, by this day. And they were on their way up into Europe. Um, now, as, as they spread through all these nations, the caliphs, the rulers of the Islamic world, were very interested in the scholarship and knowledge of the nations that they conquered. They realized that there were huge cultural gems to be harvested in all these nations. So they established uh, what's called the House of Wisdom, the Beit al-Hikmah in Baghdad by uh, Caliph Harun al-Rashid. This is the uh, Caliph of the uh, 1001 Arabian Nights, Harun al-Rashid. Uh, and so he established this House of Wisdom in Baghdad, and they, this was a center for the studies of Humanities and science, the knowledge of the world. We tried to gather it here at, in Baghdad. So uh, mathematics, astronomy, medicine, alchemy, and chemistry, zoology, geography, cartography, all branches of knowledge uh, were, were uh, gathered and concentrated here at the Beit al-Hikmah. Scholars translated many Greek, Persian, and Indian texts into Arabic. And by 850 CE, it was the greatest repository of books in the world. Unfortunately, it was destroyed by the Mongol army of Hulagu Khan in 1258. But for many hundreds of years, then, it was this focus of learning. Um, early Muslim rulers put great emphasis on education, and they founded many madrasas, which are institutions of higher learning. Um, there were 75 madrasas in Cairo, uh, 50 in Damascus. Uh, you know, there were many of them all, in all these cities. Many more in the uh, in Spain, in the uh, uh, Andalusian cities of Spain. Um, th this university in Fez, Morocco, is the I think it is the oldest madrasa uh, still 
and it's still functioning, founded in 859. Uh, um, Al-Ajar University in Cairo, Egypt is, is still there uh, for sure. Uh, you know, they taught the Quran, Islamic law, logic, grammar, rhetoric, and the calculation of lunar phases. So, uh, now many important ideas came into Europe from Islamic philosophers, and, and we shouldn't lose sight of that. Uh, um, algebra, the Arabic numeral system, obviously, came from, came from the Arab world, Arabic numerals. The decimal system, the place value decimal system, you know, we can all be grateful that we are not calculating with Roman numerals. So, so all of this came from the Islamic world. Um, the works of uh, Muhammad ibn Musa al-Khwarizmi. Al we get the word algorithm from the name al-Khwarizmi. Um, there was an emphasis on empiricism by certain Arabic philosophers. Uh, particular Ibn al-Haytham, uh, his name was Europeanized to al-Hazm, uh, did many experiments with lenses, mirrors, optical experiments. There's a way of uh, looking at the motions of, of the planets uh, called the Tusi couple, and this was used by Copernicus as he reasoned about the solar system. It was developed by uh, al-Tusi, uh, another... Arabic philosopher. And there are many other examples of this. So, so the Arabs were um, very active in the realm of natural philosophy during this period from about 800 to 1000, or well, even later, 1200. Uh, one of the greatest Arabic philosophers was Averroes, Ibn Rushdi, uh, and he was from uh, Muslim Spain. He was from Andalusia. He was a defender, he was extremely influential among European philosophers of the 12th and 13th centuries. He was a defender of Aristotelian philosophy in arguments with other Muslim philosophers. And his commentaries on Aristotle were the foundation for the Aristotelian revival in Europe of the 12th and 13th centuries. But the ironic thing is that he had a much greater impact in Europe than he did in the Islamic world. And we'll come back to, to why that was and what the effect of that was. Um, Islamic technology was pretty advanced during this period. Um, this same caliph, Harun al-Rashid, uh, lived at the same time as Charlemagne, Emperor Charlemagne in Europe, around about 800 CE. And he presented Charlemagne with many gifts. One of them was a water clock that marked the hours by dropping bronze balls into a bowl, and then little mechanical knights, one for each hour, would emerge from little doors uh, which shut behind them and then come out and then go back into the clock. So an extremely ingenious mechanical device. Uh, it was a water clock, so it was powered by, by flowing water. Uh, nobody had ever seen anything like this in Europe, okay, in the year 800. They were just amazed. Uh, possibly this device had an influence on art of that time. Here, here is a much later engraving, a woodcut of, of the, uh, the Wasser Uhr, the water clock. And so, anyway, Europe, Europeans were very impressed by uh, Islamic technology at this point. So, that, that just... Uh, it is an all too brief uh, overview of what was going on in the Islamic world during those years. Now let's take a look at China during the same time, the same time period. Uh, the Tang Dynasty. The emperor of the Tang Dynasty ruled a territory inhabited by 60 to 80 million people. He was the sole ruler of 60 to 80 million people. During this time, the capital, Chang'an, was the most populous city on earth. This is the emperor giving an audience to an ambassador from Tibet. Chang'an was called the million people city 
in 750 CE. So a million people lived in Chang'an. It was highly organized. It was laid out on a grid. Um, and actually, uh, this is a digital reconstruction of Chang'an during the Tang Dynasty. And you can find this online. There's a, there's a web link there. And you can sort of explore and fly over this digital model of Chang'an. By the way, Chang'an is now it's the city of Xi'an. It's where all the terracotta warriors are, the thousands of terracotta figures. It's that same, this is the same place. Chang'an has had numerous names over several thousand years. During the Tang, Dyn Dyn Tang Dynasty, many inventions appeared, including gunpowder, porcelain China, what we all have in our homes and call China, that, that was invented during this time. Gas cylinders, they could, uh, they found a way to compress gas into bamboo, sections of bamboo, uh, keep it at higher pressure. I think it was like um, maybe methane gas, marsh gas, natural gas. Air conditioning, it was sort of like swamp, swamp coolers, you know, flowing water with wind blowing over it, cooled the imperial palace. Chinese uh, rockets came later, probably the 13th century. Tang, Tang Dynasty is like uh, 8th century through 10th century. Woodblock printing first appeared during the Tang Dynasty. This is a page from the Diamond Sutra. It's in the British Library in London. This is the earliest complete survival of a dated printed book, of a printed book whose age we know, whose date we know. An astronomical celestial globe, or what we call an armillary sphere, was invented in China during the Tang Dynasty by, uh, by Yi Xing. He was a Chinese astronomer, mathematician, mechanical engineer, and Buddhist monk. And he built this celestial globe. Uh, it featured a clockwork escapement mechanism. An escapement is a mechanism that turns uh, rotational motion into back and forth motion. And all clocks depend on such a thing. Uh, and so here it is. This is a huge thing. He made it for, of course, the emperor. And there was only one. Uh, there's a, here's a human right here. So it's big. It's run by water power. But it, uh, what it does is it, it models the motions of the heavenly objects. So you can... Uh, you can use this to uh, make astrological predictions. It was for astrology, of course. The, uh, the, uh, anyone who knew astrology could predict the future of the imperial family. So astrological knowledge was like secret nuclear weapons data. It was a huge state secret. So uh, only, only one person could have this. The, only the emperor could have this. Okay, so that's just a couple uh, civilizations, hugely wealthy, immensely talented, extremely capable, clever people by the millions in these cultures. Which of these advanced, wealthy, talented cultures experienced a scientific revolution or an industrial revolution? Greece, Rome, Tang, China, the Islamic world, the Ottoman Empire, uh, Mughal India, 1500s to 1700s. Which of them had a scientific revolution? The answer, of course, is none of them did. And the question of why, why didn't they have, why didn't modern science appear in, in China over thousands of years? With all that talent, with all that wealth, why didn't they have a scientific revolution? The question of why these cultures did not go through their own scientific revolution is actually heavily studied and quite controversial. There are, there are dozens of answers. We don't really have time to pursue all these questions here. Uh, I, I'll just note in passing that a very interesting fellow is Joseph Needham. Um, dates 1900 to 1995. He was a British scientist, historian, and sinologist, meaning a student of China, of Chinese culture. And he, he is, uh, although he was originally, I think, a chemist and biologist, he's really known for his research and writing on the history of Chinese science. And so the Needham question 
is the question, why was China overtaken by the West in science and technology, despite its earlier successes and all of its wealth and talent? Uh, so I would just recommend a couple of uh, books here. Simon Winchester, The Man Who Loved China. It's just the story of Joseph Needham and his life and how basically, uh, well, anyway, I, there's, there's a lot to say about him, but, but it's, a, it's a good story and, and Chinese culture and history is so fascinating that it's well worth looking into. And he, uh, he edited this huge encyclopedia with many contributors about the history of science in China, the, or the history of science and technology in China. Okay, but we're not going to be able to spend much more time on this, except a little bit. I will come back to a little bit of, the, of these themes as, as we press forward. Okay, so now, having looked at the Islamic world in China, let's turn to Europe, 700 CE. Meanwhile, out west, here in Europe, um, <coughs> Europe was poor, and it was populated by illiterate tribes. So, now here's a quote from uh, uh, Edward Gibbon, wrote the history of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. He's writing about the Goths, the Vikings, the Goths, in, the, in about the year 250, so somewhat before Tom China. Uh, the, the Goths had just conquered the Ukraine. The Ukraine is like the breadbasket of Europe. It's, you know, wonderful agricultural land, lots of wheat. He says, the Goths still adhere to a life of idleness, of poverty, and of rapine. Meaning, uh, you know, basically they were kind of lazy, and they did, but they just would steal from you. And, you know, uh, we have this somewhat romantic idea of Vikings, I think. It's been... Heavily romanticized. I think this is a uh, 17th century view of Vikings. They don't, they don't look quite so fearsome, but they look pretty nasty. And, and this, is, um, uh, this is what a lot of Europe was in 700 CE. Uh, not entirely, down near the Mediterranean, of course. Roman uh, civilization had been crumbling for a long time, and there, were, there was still literacy down there. But uh, much of Europe was was uh, not very advanced. Norsemen continually raided the coasts and rivers of Europe in the 9th and 10th centuries CE. Uh, the impact was particularly lasting in northern France. The major raids began around 843. Uh, Vikings continually sailed up the rivers, looted and burned cities uh, all the way up to Paris. Uh, they ruined commerce and navigation, threatened to plunge France back into barbarism. Uh, these are not my these are not my observations. I, I have uh, let's see my reference is um, uh, Philip Dayleader, who uh, uh, teaches one of these great courses. Uh, if you're familiar with the Great Courses series, he's a professor at uh, I think Johns Hopkins, uh, and uh, so. The Norsemen posed this great threat to Europe. What happened, though, is they gradually established settlements at river mouths. And uh, finally, in the year 911, one of the kings of France got smart. This was King Charles III, known as Charles the Simple. But I think he had a really good idea. He said, let's give Rollo, one of the Norsemen's leaders, let's just give him the Duchy of Normandy. Let's give him some land. And... And uh, they were assigned to keep the peace. In other words, put down the raids by other Norsemen. And uh, they were vassals of the French king, but really only nominally. They sort of led, led their own life. However, eventually they became Christians. They adopted French law and speech, and they became the Normans. So the Norman French were these Norsemen. Uh, maybe just living in warmer climates, they just... Their mood improved. You know, I don't know, but anyway, they, they got the French women did it. The, it was the French. It was the wine. Yeah. And, uh, other maybe little known facts: human sacrifice was practiced in Northern Europe as late as about the year 1100. Uh, Gibbon again in *Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire* writes: "Till the end of the 11th century, 
a celebrated temple subsisted at Uppsala, or modern-day Uppsala, Sweden. In the general festival, every ninth year, nine animals of every species, without accepting the human, that means including humans, were sacrificed, and their bleeding bodies suspended in the sacred grove adjacent to the temple. So, human sacrifice went on for a very long time in Europe. Uh, you can still go to Gamla Uppsala, that's old Uppsala, and see uh, this area that's rich in archaeological remains. Uh, actually, all you see are these mounds of earth. Uh, but this is presumably the site of that temple at Uppsala. So as the last millennium dawned, Europe didn't amount to much. Uh, now, here I am quoting from Philip Dalier, whose great courses is called The High Middle Ages. Um, Europe in the year 1000 was one of the world's more stagnant regions. It was economically undeveloped, it was intellectually derivative, it was geopolitically passive. So that's Dalier's summary, which I think is pretty, uh, pretty damning. But anyway, illiteracy, starvation, and disease were the norm. So you compare Europe to Tang China and the Islamic Caliphate, and you would not predict anything particularly important to come out of Europe over the next hundred years, several hundred years. But major changes began to take place in Europe during the High Middle Ages. This is between 1000 and 1300. The population of Europe roughly doubled during that 300 year period. Why? Well, the weather did get better. They had better agriculture. The, the heavy plow was introduced. It was much better for plowing through that heavy, wet northern soil than the Mediterranean light plow. There was less disease. And then finally, the Vikings took a break for whatever reason. Uh, cities grew in size, therefore, they became more important. Commercial activity expanded, and uh, scholasticism arose as a philosophical and theological technique of logic and argument. Uh, it arose in the universities, which were also a new development during this time, as, as I will go on to elaborate. So things started to change. Um, partly, uh, well, much earlier, this had started to happen during the reign of Charlemagne. Uh, he took an early step towards reviving scholarship and study and literacy in Europe. Um, the lack of Latin literacy caused problems for him and all rulers because there just weren't enough people who knew how to read and write. And you know, a king has got to have somebody to write down how much he owns or you know, whatever. And so Charlemagne realized he needed more literate people. So he established schools and he brought scholars from all over the Christian world to his court. And uh, one goal they had then was the creation of a standardized curriculum for these new schools. Uh, there, the curriculum involved uh, seven subjects, rhetoric, logic, and grammar. Those three subjects together were called the trivium. And then arithmetic, geometry, music, and astronomy were called the quadrivium. And the trivium was regarded as simpler than the quadrivium. You may have used the term trivial. So that means it relates to the trivium. Also, Irish monks began spreading out over Europe, taking learning and literacy with them. Why did they do that? Well, Ireland was, is you know, the furthest reach of Europe, and so it was kind of a safe place to withdraw to as European civilization crumbled. But then the Vikings started raiding down around Ireland. Uh, as we saw around the year 800, they started raiding in France. And Ireland and those uh, islands, uh, the British Isles, uh, received their share of attention from the Vikings. So this tended to drive the monks back into Europe now. So many European towns were founded by or linked to Irish monks. And here's a long list of European towns that have an Irish monk who uh, established them. Uh, by the way, another very interesting book is Thomas Cahill's How the Irish Saved Civilization. So I, mean, he, I think he, that's sort of an extreme and provocative way of saying it, but it, it's, uh, it's a good book and it sort of describes the process by which uh, 
Irish monks spread learning and literacy. Uh, here's a quote from, uh, from the life of St. Germanus, written in 870. Almost all of Ireland, despising the sea, is migrating to our shores with so many philosophers. So, I guess there were lots of these folks. And here's a quote from uh, one of these monks, Johannes Scotus Eriugena, who, who writes back then, uh, he says, uh, uh, the true philosophy is the true religion, and the true religion is the true philosophy. And when he says philosophy, you know, he means sort of like science. Now, during this time, uh, well, let's see, even long before this time, Judeo-Christian writers had long ago developed the concept of Liber Natura, the book of nature. Well, the Bible itself says, the heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of his hands, day after day they pour forth speech. This is Psalm 19. Um, as if looking at the heavens is telling us about God. St. Augustine, as long ago as the 4th century, says, we can consider the whole of creation regarding God as its author by reading, so to speak, in the great book of nature. Hugh of St. Victor, now is living in the 11th century, uh, 12th century, says, the whole of the sensible world is like a book written by the finger of God. And the individual creatures are like symbols or letters that are not invented in an arbitrary way by man, but ordained according to the will of God in order to demonstrate his wisdom. So nature is, is a book we can read. This idea is found throughout Judeo-Christian theology. Now, um, there was also... There was a legal revolution during medieval times. I mean, before there was an industrial revolution, before there was a scientific revolution, there was a legal revolution. Um, and basically what it meant was a, for, a formalization of the concept of law. You know, before this re legal revolution, there was only the king's law. The king would decide what was right, what was wrong. If you had an argument with somebody, you went to the king, and the king would decide. There wasn't, there wasn't established law. But after the legal revolution, there was. And so one aspect is this concept of a fictional legal personality. You know, you know what a fictional legal personality is. Um, a university is a fictional legal personality. Uh, any corporation is a, is a legal person. Of course, it's not a person of flesh and blood, but it's a person in the sense of being able to own property, to sue and be sued, to inherit property. This idea uh, of a fictional legal personality dates back to the Romans. Uh, they had this concept of uh, organizations of people acting collectively as a single legal entity. That's, that's what it means. Um, Examples today are, uh, would be like uh, trade, trade guilds, or trade unions, a union, a university, towns and municipalities, uh, and, and corporations, uh, industrial corporations. Pope Innocent IV in the 12th century is credited for helping to revive this idea because he realized this was a way that monks who were pledged to poverty could nevertheless uh, be part of an organization that owned infrastructure. So, so this is useful for the church. This concept does not exist in Islamic law or in Chinese law. It's strictly a Roman and European concept. Uh, you know, and the church itself is a good example of a of an entity that uh, is not itself a flesh and blood person, but is a collection of people, and, uh, and can outlive any single individual. 
This is important because this will give rise then to the university, to the medieval university. Medieval guilds, trade guilds, were one example of universitas, fictive legal, fictive legal personality. Uh, and so th these guilds were associations of artisans who gathered together to maintain and defend their common rights and interests. Uh, in France, they were authorized by the king to make their own laws by which they could govern themselves. And the members enjoyed special privileges. Um, to, they had the right to assemble and freely discuss their own internal affairs. Uh, they got to dress up and wear special garb at festivals, stuff like that. Uh, There's this uh, book written in 1268 that lists the rules and customs of over 100 different guilds and associations. So by the 13th century, you know, this was a very important way of organizing. Um, so they had this right to assemble. That was very important. So universities, as we know them today, got their start during medieval times as guilds of professors. So they were the, it was just the professor's trade guild, like the shoemakers or the, or the, uh, the hatters, you know. This was the professor's guild. Uh, some universities were, were begun as students' guilds. The first universities were established in Italy, France, Spain, and England in the 11th and 12th centuries. Um, and uh, the, their development coincided with the widespread introduction of Aristotle, um, and they, the typical European university put the study of Aristotle right at the center of its curriculum. So, as an internally regulated corporation, yeah. Uh, quick question, I, just, I was wondering, would you know what the oldest, the, the name of the oldest university is? I think it's Bologna, here, 1088 in, in Europe, yeah, I think that's it. Okay. Um, the university was protected from external intervention. So, the, uh, at least by the local authorities. So the Pope in the year 1231 guaranteed the University of Paris independence from any local secular or church authority. So in Paris, you could, in your university, you could get away with a whole lot and the only person who could come down on you was the Pope, but he was hundreds of miles away in, in Rome. So they were directly under papal patronage. And that's, that's what that says. Um, now, while this was going on, as I said, new and better translations of Greek thinkers such as Aristotle and Euclid became available in Europe. Uh, the Islamic world had access to these philosophers several centuries earlier, but now good Latin translations were being made from the Arabic versions. Aristotle wrote about everything, physics, biology, zoology, theater, music, rhetoric, linguistics, everything. Uh, he, Aristotle was absolutely encyclopedic, and so when Europe came face to face with Aristotle, they realized this is somebody we have got to take into consideration, even though he posed great problems for them, as we'll get to. Euclid, Euclid's geometry, you know, is a profound demonstration of the power of human reason to to discover new knowledge. Really, uh, if if you don't know anything about geometry and you start to go through that stuff, you'll realize this is a way to, this is the way to find out new stuff. And, it, and it, it seems to be, you know, when you're reasoning about triangles and circles and planes, those almost seem to be real objects, like in the physical universe. So the concept that you can use reason to really discover truth about the universe is bound up in Euclid, and of course, the Greeks carried it to a great extreme. They were they were uh, put a huge emphasis on reason. Uh, so this was all now coming into the European universities as they were getting started. Um, now now here's the problem. As I say, Aristotle could not be ignored. He was just too massive, too too uh, deep and broad a thinker to be ignored. But he posed a huge problem for Christians already in the 13th century. We're not talking Darwin here, you know. You know, this is 
we're not talking Galileo or Copernicus. We're centuries before that. Christianity had this big problem with Aristotle. Why is that? His writings covered all of knowledge systematically. You could call him the first genuine scientist in history. He emphasized cause and effect, um, uh, universal abstract concepts. That's, that's what he worked on. But, it, but here's the problem. They've got these autonomous, self-governing institutions of higher learning, universities, and now they import into these universities Aristotle's powerful cosmology, like a sort of time bomb because his work challenged and contradicted many aspects of traditional Christian worldview. Aristotle said the universe was infinitely old. The Bible, of course, says exactly the opposite. The universe had a definite beginning. God created it at a certain, a certain point in time. So he directly contradicts Genesis. Aristotle's God is not the creator of the universe. The universe never had a creator in Aristotle's viewpoint. In Aristotle's universe, there are no immortal souls. The soul is not immortal. There is no divine grace. So Christianity had a real problem with Aristotle. And you know, this whole idea of cause and effect, causality, is sort of a threat to a theistic worldview. And early on, Islam rejected Aristotle and causality. Uh, an important name is Al-Ghazali, lived in the uh, 11th, early 12th century. He vehemently rejected Aristotle and Plato. Uh, he propounded a point of view called theological occasionalism, which is the belief that causal events and interactions are not the product of materialistic conjunctions, but rather they are the immediate and present will of Allah. Causality was viewed as a limitation on Allah's power. So he writes, the connection between what is usually believed to be a cause and what is believed to be an effect is not a necessary connection. It is in God's power to create satiety without eating and death without decapitation and to let life persist notwithstanding the decapitation, and so on, with respect to all connections. So, Allah can do whatever He wants, and our ideas of cause and effect are irrelevant. Now, Averroes, who we saw earlier, strongly defended Aristotle, and wrote a rebuttal to Al-Ghazali's ideas. Al-Ghazali actually lived a couple hundred years before Averroes, but, but it didn't matter. The course of Islamic thought had been set. The Islamic world basically walked away from Aristotle and these ideas of cause and effect and the validity of reason and all these Aristotelian ideas. Um, it's not, you know, it's not clear. I don't know whether Al-Ghazali was himself the... Uh, the instigator of this point of view in the Islamic world, or whether he was merely writing down what everybody already thought uh, amongst his contemporaries. But for whatever reason, this, this was the, the great branching off of the Islamic world from the march towards what eventually became modern science in Europe. But Christianity had the same problem, okay? You could view cause and effect as a limitation on God's power. So Thomas Aquinas set out to show that Aristotle's philosophy was compatible with and even supported by Scripture. He studied and taught at the University of Paris and lived, uh, he lived a rather short life, 1225 to 1274, so not even 50 years old. His teacher was Albertus Magnus, Albert the Great, Albertus Magnus considered it vitally important to reconcile Aristotle with Christian thinking, but he didn't quite know how to do it. Um, so Aquinas picked this up from his teacher. He blended Greek philosophy and Christian doctrine. So uh, rational thinking and the study of nature were valid ways to understand truths about God. 
God reveals himself through nature. So to study nature is to study God, as we saw in the idea of the book of nature. Aquinas believed reason and revelation could not conflict since they both come from God. Uh, knowledge comes not by separating ourselves from this world, but through the intellect's power to abstract truth from our changing perceptions of the world. So, uh, so this was hugely important. I, you know, I lived most of my life not really understanding what was so great about Thomas Aquinas. I can never really grasp that whenever I tried to find out. But during the last few years as I studied this, I realized this, this was huge. I mean, this is the difference between why the Islamic world is the way it is and why European culture ended up the way it is. Um, on the particular subject of the eternity of the world, is, is the universe actually infinitely old or not? Aquinas had an unusual viewpoint. He's, um, many philosophers since Aristotle had various opinions for or against the eternity of the world. Is the world really infinitely old or not? And a whole lot of ink was expended writing various opinions about that. Aquinas took a different approach. He said, basically, we don't know. We can't know. You know, Right now, we just can't say one way or the other whether the universe is infinitely old. Uh, that you can't prove it by logical argument alone. You need something else. Perhaps revelation, or perhaps more data. You know, I think he probably emphasized revelation, because in Genesis we have the assertion that the universe is not infinitely old. But, but he went on, he said, even if, the, even if the universe is infinitely old, God could have created it anyway. He said, God could be an instantaneous and motionless creator, and could have the he could have created the world without preceding it in time. In other words, he infers that God is outside of 4D space-time. You know, six centuries before Einstein. I, I think that's really, that's really advanced. It's a good piece of thinking, but anyway. I think it's good he didn't commit himself to one opinion or the other. Well, okay, the controversy over Aristotle was not settled by the thinking of any single person, even Aquinas. In fact, Aquinas came close to being excommunicated. Uh, there is an event <coughs> called the Condemnation of 1277. Uh, 1277, Aquinas had been dead for a few years at this point. Some of the theologians at the University of Paris were complaining that um, some of the philosophers were talking about forbidden subjects. Uh, for example, that there was no first man, nor will there be a last. On the contrary, there always was and always, always will be generation of man from man. So, I mean, this, this uh, contradicts the idea of Adam and Eve being the first humans. Um, there was a list of 219 propositions like this, kind of, you know, kind of controversial, scandalous ideas that the philosophers were discussing, and the theologians didn't like this. And so they wrote to the Pope, and the Pope instructed the, the bishop to investigate these, these complaints. So the Pope, uh, or the Bishop of Paris then said, uh, uh, on the Pope's authority, anyone teaching or listening to the listed errors would be excommunicated unless they turn themselves into the bishop or the chancellor within seven days. Well, okay. Um, the, this, is a, this is an example of conflict between church and philosophy. Um, some historians view this as actually an opportunity to move beyond Aristotle. Uh, Aristotle was wrong about a whole lot of things we now know. And um, although he had some good ideas. And so this actually stimulated people to think about things other than Aristotle. Um, but it was too late. This condemnation really didn't have much effect. And uh, 
Aristotle's natural books were already embedded in the curriculum of not just the University of Paris, but in universities all over Europe. Uh, Aquinas' reputation may have suffered somewhat for a little while, but he was canonized then, 60, or 46 years later, in July 1323. So there, there was this little bit of, of upset after this condemnation, but pretty quick everybody got back to Aristotle and the course of philosophy continued after that. And Aquinas became a saint then in the year 1323. So uh, I think this episode is interesting because it just shows that Christianity has always dealt with controversial topics. It has always been challenged by new thinking, and yet um, uh, people have eventually realized that there is there's really not a problem here. And Aquinas is a good example of that. So it's clear that the church sometimes did oppose the progress of science. And so Aristotle is an example. Atomism, the idea that matter is composed of atoms separated by vacuum, was strongly opposed by the church. Um, but, um, Heliocentrism is the idea that the earth moves and the sun is at the center of the whole solar system. And as you're aware from the Galileo affair, the church was strongly opposed to that. I think, I'm trying to remember what it was about atomism that, that set off the church, and of course it was the Catholic church at the time. Uh, I think the idea of transubstantiation of uh, does do bread and wine actually become the body and blood of Christ? If you believe in atoms, you have trouble seeing how that could actually happen. So I think that's, that's, that's part of the church's opposition to the idea of atoms. But the important point is that church opposition had almost no effect on scientific progress um, when it occurred, when such opposition did occur. So, you know it's a somewhat complex relationship between uh, uh, Christianity and science. Um, there were many general ways that Christianity aided the rise of modern science, as we've already discussed. The idea that the universe is God's creation. We can expect regular regularities, laws, and patterns in it. Uh, since we are created in God's image, we should expect ultimately that we ought to be able to understand creation, at least at some level. If, if, if our minds are in some sense an image of, of God's mind, however imperfect. And in fact, science itself is a gift from God so that we can read the book of nature. Uh, of course, lots of stuff was going on during the high Middle Ages. Um, and I, I haven't done any justice at all to the, the whole uh, range of activity during the Middle Ages. Uh, the Crusades were very important actually in opening up Arabic writing and bringing it back to the West so it could be translated and, and uh, Europe could get these good translations of Aristotle and Euclid. Um, travelers branched out from Europe going to Asia. You know, you've heard of Marco Polo, but Long before Marco Polo, there were many other travelers who left Europe to travel to China and uh, learn about the outside world. Um, mechanical clocks began to replace water clocks by the end of the 1200s. And mechanical clocks um, were, were very important as uh, sort of the first technology that could be refined and ultimately could be used to produce high quality scientific instruments um, that would become very important during the scientific revolution, of course. Uh, many of these important scientists during the scientific revolution were educated at the universities of Europe. And uh, it's also clear that the religious commitment of these scientists during the scientific revolution itself was very strong. These were very devout people, Copernicus uh, and Kepler. Um, 
speak of, of how they hope that this uh, knowing the mighty works of God must be a pleasing and acceptable mode of worship to the Most High, says Copernicus. Uh, I have revealed the majesty of thy works to those men who will read my works, says Kepler, in this prayer uh, directly addressing God. And Galileo speaks of the, the divine wisdom uh, and how clearly he sees that human intelligence is a work of God. So, um, so in summary then, here is uh, just a recapitulation of, of the talk and uh, uh, I'll be happy to take any questions.